All right, hello everyone. Hopefully you all can hear me and uh, let me introduce my co-host here. This is Steven Ablonsi. Uh, he's a good colleague of mine, good friend, and uh, also quite knowledgeable on the Queen Mary. And so we're all here going to learn from him. So say hello to everyone, Steve. Hello, everybody. And uh, Steve, you have been working on your own YouTube channels as well recently. Do you want to pop some info in here about that? Oh, wow. So I'm I'm shooting for May 1st to, to start the Blue Ribbon channel. I've had Blue Ribbon Productions, golly, since, oh like early 2000s like 2005 2006 some not too long after i think even youtube started but didn't really expand on it very much so look for may 1st uh and i i think you have the blue ribbon channel in the uh description i do yes yeah. so if people want to visit the blue ribbon channel the link is in the description below so we'll you can start, visit steve's channel and we'll start getting some some new content on there yeah all right, so we are going to be doing part two of Queen Mary Tech 101. The part one, which I believe I also put the link down in the description below, um, was really more about the boilers and how they generate steam for the ship. And then this one will be about the, um, the actual engines and the turbo generators which produce the power. So... Um, oh, and I wanted to mention to everybody first, um, normally during live streams, yeah, I do answer like a lot of questions. I talk to people in the chat. I will be reading your guys' chat comments, but not out loud um, because we do have a lot to get to. But at the end of the stream, if there's lots of time, then we'll go and try to answer people's questions towards the end. Yeah, we, <laughs> especially when I've been on here with you, we push these things to two hours. I'm shooting for 90 minutes we'll see how that goes <laughs> so okay let's see here well um are you ready i am ready okay. okay let's start with the slideshow first slideshow sure let me get that up here okay always opens towards the top of my screen not where it needs to okay so please forgive uh there's like this bar down here that shows all the photos and I cannot get rid of it for the life of me. Maybe if I just zoom oh, in there you go. Like one like that. There we go. Okay. So, Oh my God, molecules. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be afraid. I am not a chemist. I am not a physicist. I am not going to be teaching anything of the sort, but we do have to understand that steam that we're going to be referring to is just nothing more than two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. So we're looking at the molecules of H2O. Next slide. Oh, of course, it's not going to let me do that. <laughs> Be yeah. nice to like click, you know, like an arrow button. Right. And it won't let exactly. me do that. Exactly. <laughs> H2O, which we refer to as water. And we're going to briefly go into the different phases of water. Next slide. So the very first phase is solid, which we referred to as ice. And I think uh, we've been getting quite a bit of that uh, over the last month. I think some Definitely. of us, some of us can, can do without the ice, but it uh, it's basically the molecules are barely moving at, at absolute zero. It, they aren't moving at all. They are completely still. Um, as it warms up, the molecules will actually start to move around and become separated from each other. And we'll go into that. Uh, go ahead and next phase or next to uh, next picture. Absolutely. Oh, wait, that's the same one. Here we go. Nope. Is no, that no. the right one? Yeah. Yep. You were right. Okay. No, no. Keep going back. Back. Back? Back. What? They're not the I... it's not the same slide. Yeah. Oh. One more back. Really? Yep. I think you might be right if you get that box out of the way. Oh, I see. Okay, there's okay. There's the difference. There's words at the bottom. 
<laughs> my illiterate self. <laughs> As you can see, we had no time for a rehearsal on this. So. <laughs> yeah, so from 32 degrees Fahrenheit up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, we have water, which is you know the liquid state. And I think we're pretty familiar with that. We drink it every day, or at least we should be drinking it every day. And then the I fill myself with tea. Uh, well, it's still water. It's just you've just added little tiny fragments of tea in it. <laughs> you can go to the next one. And so above 212 degrees is steam, or is or is referred to as a gas. Now there's there's going to be a really complicated mess of how water and gas combine there's a go ahead and do the, go to the next one Look, i think we can go yeah because that's going to go to steam okay so and i think you can go to the next one too and you can go to the next one i don't know why those weren't okay so at, boy and i can't see that from my screen here i can i think i can uh yeah there we go so these are based at what we call sea level. Um, and Queen Mary is you can't get any more at sea level than on the sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and these are based in three three different uh, ranges of, of temperature here. We, we do have Kelvin. Kelvin actually is it the boiling point is 373 Kelvin at sea level. Water freezes at 273 point, I think that's 0.35 Kelvin. 0.15. Is that 0.15? Okay, 0.15. Yeah. And then absolute zero, which is negative 459.67. Is that what it says? Um. At, well, okay. So for for Fahrenheit, it is neg yeah, negative 459.67. 0. 0.67, right. You, the only time that you can get to absolute zero is in the vacuum of space. We, you can reach almost absolute zero on Earth, but uh, artificially. But absolute zero is in the vacuum of space. Um, so we also have Celsius, which is 100 degrees Celsius is boiling point uh, temperature, freezing at zero Celsius, and then absolute zero is it's 223.15. Celsius? Uh, 273.15. 273.15. Okay, you can go to the next. You can go, uh, I think you can go to the next slide from there. So atmospheric pressure at sea level is zero PSI. And we're going to be referring to PSI quite a bit. Now I've got PSIG, which is referring to gauge pressure. Atmospheric pressure already at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. And that's what PSI stands for, pounds per square inch. The A in this figure is, is reading absolute. So atmospheric pressure already has 14.7 pounds per square inch. As we go higher in the atmosphere, the uh, pressure increases as we go if you go below sea level, like if you go into Death Valley, you'll actually go below atmospheric pressure. And we're also dealing with three different laws. They're all referred to as gaseous law, but there's three different laws that the Queen Mary's boilers and engine rooms take on. And that's Boyle's law, Charles' law, and the gay lussex law. And the... Uh, well, boy, I should have, let's see, I can pull this up on my screen. No problem. That way I can read it. So Boyle's Law is basically the pressure and the volume of a gas has an inverse relationship. If the volume increases, then the pressure decreases and vice versa. So the the description there, the, the image that you see, is as the piston is pushing down on the volume, pressure goes up. As volume increases, pressure goes down. That's Boyle's law. Charles' law, you go to the next slide. Sure. 
is the volume of a given mass of gas will vary directly with the absolute temperature of the gas when the pressure is kept constant. So if you have, uh, if the temperature is the same and you increase or decrease volume, pressure is going to stay the same. And next one. Okay. okay. And then Gay Lussac's law is basically the pressure of a given mass of gas varies directly with the absolute temperature of the gas when the volume is kept constant. So the thing that we'll need to remember, and the reason why I'm showing you this, is because temperature and pressure always coincide. The higher the pressure, the higher the temperature. When you lower the temperature, you lower the pressure. You can actually lower the temperature of water uh, by creating a vacuum. You'll actually create a boiling point like near zero degrees if you if you bring down and go into like an inch of an inch of mercury of pressure. Um, and that's a whole other story that we're not going to get into right now. Okay, I think you can go to the next one. Okay. So we're going to talk about the type type, of types of steam. Yeah, you can go to the next one. So remember, I was telling you about how there's a mess of of a variation of steam, and that all begins at that point. Say you're at sea level and you're boiling water at 212 degrees. Um, if you put a tea kettle on the stove and you're boiling the water and it reaches 212 degrees, you're going to get that plume of steam coming out of the tea kettle. And that is what we call wet saturated steam or usually referred to as a vapor. It's visible. It's very heavy. It will condensate almost immediately when it, when it touches something like if you, if you put a piece of glass, you know, over the, the plume of steam, you know, it'll, you'll start to get water droplets. It's very heavy in water condensate in there. So uh, that is right at the point of boiling. So at sea level, at normal pressure, 212 degrees, and you'll get wet saturated steam. Okay, go ahead and do the next one. So we have dry saturated steam, which is what we're dealing with. It... it uh, the uh, the Scotch boilers, the hotel service, and the auxiliary boilers, they are producing dry saturated steam, which is to a point to where you have very little moisture, but there is some in the steam, but you are creating, uh, you're heating it to such a point to where you're removing almost all of the all of the moisture out of it. So when you look at the tea kettle. In the image there, there's that one point right at the tip where it's invisible. That's dry saturated steam. It's you're still near boiling point temperature. You're you're really close to boiling point temperature, but uh, it's above to a point to where there is very little moisture in there, to where it's invisible. Okay, next one. So the Queen Mary's main boilers and what the the main propulsion turbines function on is superheated steam. And superheated steam is when it is still, there is still a very, very small amount of, of a moisture in the line, but almost, almost nil. But you are bringing the temperature well above boiling point. With the main boilers, we're talking... 425 pounds per square inch, but heated up to 700 degrees. And the reason why the image is blank is because superheated steam is invisible. It's a very dangerous thing. Uh, you know, when you, you had often, you know, like broomsticks, you know, sticks of wood that you would, you know, if you know that there's a steam leak somewhere that you'll, you'll need to, 
take that stick of wood and wave it around until it actually like chops off the the wood because the the pressure is so great the temperatures are so great and you can't see it you know you'd rather chop off the piece of wood than you, you would your arm or your head <laughs> it's i mean it's essentially like at that point it's just a superheated gas it's not it even is a, saturated like exactly I know that that blows a lot of people's minds. Like, like what Steve said, it's, it's not saturated. So you don't see it condensing on anything. You can't see it. It's invisible. Right. And it, it's under extreme pressure at that point. And right. heat as well. Right. The heat of it is just. As, ridiculous. as, as that superheated steam started to, to fill the compartment, let's say you had a leak in a boiler room. Um, you're going to start to get, you're going to start to get saturated steam but quite a distance away, it's going to start to just kind of sit and hover, and it is still going to be very hot. And that was the situation with the uh, with the uh, boiler explosion on the SS Norway. The initial explosion damaged sea deck, which is what well on the SS Norway it was referred to as I ninety five. That's the the uh, uh, the service passageway that ran you know, fore and aft on the ship. And from sea deck, you had, you know, there was access for crew. It, you know, there were quarters. It also led to, to some crew accommodations. And so when the boiler explosion happened, the superheated steam uh, infiltrated into sea deck and waft you know just wafted its way through c deck and into those accommodation areas for crew and i think one of the one of the victims was like taking a shower and the next thing he knew was that his skin is literally boiling off of him that's that yeah that's the situation all right wow okay. yeah okay let me go to the next slide Hmm. So, do you think we should talk about steam engine history? I mean, we probably should, but next slide. Google it. <laughs> we will be here for hours and hours and hours uh, if we talk about steam engine history. The only thing that I'm showing there is the Heroes engine, which is, you know, it's a... Uh, uh, built in, well, designed in 80 AD by a hero of Alexandria. Uh, it's referred to as the very first steam engine ever created. However, there's controversy, well, not controversy, but you know, it it's actually not even the very first. There's, if you look on the internet, there's also talk about it being discussed in, in literature, you know, in, you know, 100 BC. So, uh, so yeah, so we don't have the time I don't have the time. <laughs> I don't have the energy. <laughs> Too much to go through, but you can go ahead to the next slide. Not enough steam to get us through it. Not enough steam. <laughs> so oh, wow. I we got some Titanic and Queen Mary facts here. So I want yeah, so I wanted to just kind of touch base a little bit on a, a Titanic Queen Mary comparison. Um first off, I want to talk about size. And, and, you know, I'll just briefly go through this. We, we know that Titanic was 882 feet, 9 inches long. Queen Mary was 1,019 feet, 6, six inches long. Uh, Titanic's beam was 92 feet, 6 inches. Queen Mary's is 118 feet. Height, keel to funnel, top of funnels, 175 feet on Titanic, 181 feet on Queen Mary. Definitely larger. She sat in the water deeper on Queen Mary, 38 feet, 9 inches, versus Titanic was 34 feet, 7 inches. Notice we have displacement. Displacement tonnage, and that's spelled T-O-N-N-E-S, which means it's long in long tons, which is 2,240 pounds as opposed to 2,000 pounds. Uh, displacement is basically you are displacing water. When, when you put a ship, a heavy any heavy object in water, it's going to displace the water that was in that area. You're creating a void. So how they they determine displacement is you basic basically figure out the cubic 
feet of what displacement you've made in the water. And then uh, I think it's 64, 64 pounds per cubic foot of, of seawater. And so it's 64 point something pounds. Uh, so 64 point something pounds per cubic feet. So you figure out how many cubic feet of, of seawater you have displaced, and that gives you the weight of the ship. And then we figure gross tonnage. We've we've talked about that I think in 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 uh, in the past that gross tonnage has absolutely no uh, relation to physical weight of the ship. It has to do with with uh, non machinery space enclosed enclosed deck space. I think a gross ton is a hundred cubic feet of enclosed non machinery deck space. So there is no. You know, we know for sure that Queen Mary definitely almost almost double the size as far as weight is concerned. Um, the Titanic had triple screws. Queen Mary had quadruple screws. The Titanic had reciprocating engines, and we're going to go into that briefly. Uh, for her outer wing screws, the center was a low pressure turbine and we'll we'll talk briefly about that here also in a minute whereas the queen mary had four uh parsons quadruple expansion impulse reaction turbines and we'll also go into that in a minute but shaft horsepower total combined shaft horsepower on the queen mary at normal oper <clears throat> normal operating conditions was 200,000 horsepower total shaft horsepower on the titanic was only 46,000 shaft horsepower Okay, and next one. So by the early 1900s, there were two main types of marine propulsion for ships. And that was a reciprocating engine, which we see on the left. And we see the open exposed rotor of a turbine on the right. These are actually, I'm sure probably most people probably recognize, these are both actually from Titanic um, before their installation. This is taken at Harlan and Wolf. Um, but the triple expansion reciprocating engine that we see on the left was humongous. One of the largest ever built it's three, three stories tall. Um, I forget what the weight is. The total weight of the actual entire assembly is, but that only produced 16,000 horsepower. The, Low-pressure turbine on the right that drove the center screw, much smaller in size than, than the reciprocating engine, also produced 16,000 horsepower. So it came down to a point to where they realized, you know, you've got, a much, uh, you've got the need for space, need for weight uh, that you have to take into consideration when you're building more modern ships and as you know as the mauritania and lusitania were built and and moving forward the reciprocating engine was almost by world war one it was almost uh obsolete they were still building ships with reciprocating it was still building reciprocating engines during world war ii but uh it was an obsolete design for uh for marine for marine propulsion okay we can go ahead So as we talk about the Queen Mary's uh, turbines, uh, we need to also understand that there are two different types of turbines. There are impulse type and there are reaction type. And it all has to do with the way that the design of the blades are with it, it, on the rotor and the fixed blades in the casing of, of the turbine itself. And on the left, you can see how the steam is actually directed into what what's known as a nozzle and the nozzle is purposely directed into the first stage of uh, or row of blades and the blades are actually like cupped so that they're going to grab that steam from the nozzle and and push and you can see the arrow is pushing upward but the curve on the other end is actually moving it towards the next uh, fixed uh, set of rotors uh, of, um, of blades 
which will then direct it again to the second stage of of uh, blades that again will cup it and this is this is for uh for superheated uh gas steam turbines uh as you go lower and more saturated uh it doesn't work as well so they go to what's known as a reaction type which is basically you have a, a, a an intake of steam and that will pass through a set of fixed blades to the set of rotating blades and the rotating blades are shaped a little bit more like an airplane wing you you have a curved portion on the top uh, a concave portion in the bottom and it will help direct the flow and turn turn the rotor itself in that same direction and then it will you know continue on flow into the next set of fixed blades and then the next set of rotating blades and if you remember on that previous slide mentioning about the queen mary the queen mary actually has both and we'll go that go to that in a minute okay next, next slide. slide next slide <clears throat> and I, I think yeah this is the last slide so the entire setup for the queen mary is what's known as a rankin cycle it's a closed circuit loop consisting of four parts now there's a there's there's a whole bunch of other parts to the entire loop that goes into but in order for it to be a rankin cycle you have these four main parts of the system you start out with one which is your, your a water feed source and the water feed source is is pumped into a boiler which is your second part the boiler heats the water up to steam the steam comes out of the boiler goes to a turbine the turbine spins which is your third this is your third part and then the exhausted steam that has lost pressure and lost temperature will go to a condenser which in this case it's showing there's a cold water loop and on the queen mary it was the condensers were uh fed with seawater and that will totally convert the exhausted steam back to water and the whole cycle you know starts all over again it's pumped out of the well of the condenser it goes in now on the queen mary we'll talk a little bit about you know how it's heated up and everything before it gets back to the boilers but this is this is the basic system of of what the queen mary is based on all right okay what shall i show next you can do the side profile and then we can talk about uh yeah so for those folks uh who are wondering kind of the layout of the queen mary while steve prepares for the next <laughs> the next part of the lecture um so basically the queen mary's uh steam propulsion system is set up with you know you have boiler room one which i feel like this is not hold on this is not the high definition <laughs> This is not the high definition one I have. Hold on. Um, uh, hold on. Computer is thinking while I open a file. And mine was doing that just earlier. It, it always wants Here to think go. when I don't want it to think. <laughs> okay, here's the high definition one. Okay. Okay, so uh, boiler room one is the three... Uh, marine scotch boilers, uh, the ones that produce the dry saturated steam that Steve was talking about. Then you got boiler rooms two, three, four, and five uh, that each have the Yarrow boilers that produce the superheated steam for the propulsion system of the ship. And then you behind that, you have the two forward and aft engine rooms each containing two sets of engines, each driving a propeller. And then we'll get into how the engines are set up in a little bit. I don't wanna spoil any surprises, but yes. So <laughs> that is the layout of the Queen Mary. But I, I'm going to, uh, I was thinking about this the other day and I was not even sure where to, to even tell you, but I have to tell a joke before I move on to the next part. Okay. Why does the ocean roar? 
Why does the ocean roar? Why does the ocean roar? Hmm. You would roar too if you had crabs on your bottom. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just terrible. Uh, I've known that joke since I think I was three or four. And yeah, it even took me a little while to get that, you know, joke when you're that young. But yeah, it's so funny that I love that joke. So okay. this is an overhead view of the of the same thing I was just telling you guys. So this is looking down, but there's the three scotch boilers. Here's the four different boiler rooms with the Yarrow boilers in each one. You've got the forward and after turbo generator rooms, which we'll talk about later. And then the forward and aft engine rooms, you can see each set of engines. Well, you know, I was going to do the turbo generator and the, the whole auxiliary last, but you know what? I think wow. maybe we might just want to touch that first. And I'll tell you this right now. I, I don't really want to go very much into because the auxiliary system of the, the auxiliary steam systems of the queen mary are we, we would also be here for a day to talk about all the different systems and that's going you know between hotel and the main auxiliary you know for, for pumps and for um uh glands uh, on the on the turbines uh uh, eject or uh, air ejectors, you know, all of this is is just unnecessary to to really go into. We, we would be here forever, but let's break down a little bit. So, zoom into boiler room one. Okay. So, boiler room one has the three the three double ended Scotch boilers, and and these are referred to as the hotel service boilers, and. Uh, they were the primary source for auxiliary steam that would supply the three turbo generators, which is in the forward turbo generator room. Can you zoom over just a little bit to show that? The forward turbo generator? Yeah. Okay, that's right. <clears throat> they don't show the actual generators. But it, you can see that the, the turbo generator room in this drawing is divided. It, there's like one third right. So the open section... Uh, leading to starboard side would have the three generators running four to you know four to aft and uh let's see if i can pull up some information here uh there were three in this in this turbo generator room uh they each supplied between 1300 and 1600 kilowatts of 225 volts dc um they ran on 230 PSI. So it's 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 dry saturated steam. Uh the interesting thing about the turbo generators is the fact that they were all kind of independent. They all had their own um uh their their own their own uh, condensers, their own extraction pumps. It, it, it everything was independent of each other. You could shut one down and and it wouldn't affect the others. Uh now we were talking about in the with the boilers how at sea the ship would run with with all three scotch boilers uh online when she would be in port they would go down to two shutting one down and then and then in dry dock typically there was one at least one scotch boiler that was usually always fired um kind of the same thing with the with the uh, hotel service generators um you could you would need to get at least one running to run pumps and and fuel heaters and all that stuff but uh, uh but you know when they were in port uh and also in the middle of the night you know you, lights are going out uh you're not running as much uh of the hotel I many you know people are not plugging things in so only two of the three generators usually were needed at night or when they were in port um and then, but then during the day, you would bring up three online and they would alternate them. Like you wouldn't always have one shut down. They would say, okay, well, the, the port side one will be down today. The port side one will be down. Uh, the starboard side one will be down tomorrow. The the midship one would be, uh, or the center line uh, one would be, you know, the, the following day. And they would rotate that so that you would always keep a consistency. You wouldn't wear out one more than the other. 
And the other thing we uh, that uh, Rob and I were going over was the fact that they carried an entire turbo generator spare on board. They could replace an entire turbo generator unit, the whole the whole thing. Where was that? I don't know where they stored it. Um, but there's a list that that Rob has of the required spare parts that were, you know, necessity for the Queen Mary to, to always have in stock. And one of them is an entire turbo generator. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, this will kind of lead into talking about the main boilers as well, but the auxiliary and uh, main steam for all of the boilers pass through the upper fore and aft sections of the boiler room compartments themselves. Can you pull up that, that picture of boiler room three? Yes. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and then, yeah, I guess you zoom into, so it's really, again, you know, if I could go to the ship right now and take some good pictures, I would, but, um, so we're we're seeing looks like an auxiliary and a and a main steam line. Uh, the the main steam lines uh, there were two on the port side, there were two on the aft side. There were also two auxiliary steam lines uh, that ran on the port, or one on the port and one on the starboard. And then um, I'm sorry, two on the port and then two on the starboard. Uh, the main steam lines were 16 and 16 and a half inches in diameter and the auxiliaries were nine inches in diameter. And uh, as they passed through the boiler rooms, they also tied into the branch mains, which also, which passed, you know, uh, perpendicularly to the ship. And from those branch mains, the, the individual boilers would actually be connected to the branch mains. Now, uh, Let's go back to the drawing of the boiler rooms. The uh, colorful one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll, we'll pick boiler room two, for example. So boiler room two, you have six boilers total. You have, a, you have two on the port, you have two on the starboard, and you have two in the center. So it was... Let's see if I can... I should have that information. I believe it starts port um, let's see here so boiler room two and boiler room four were the assigned boiler rooms for the forward engine room boiler rooms three and boiler rooms five fed steam to the aft engine room the port side boilers of boiler rooms two uh, two through five always fed the port side engines of either the forward or the aft engine room. So boiler rooms two and four's port boilers fed the port side forward engine uh, in the forward engine room. The starboard two in boiler rooms two and four would feed the starboard side engine in the forward turbo generator room. I mean, in the forward engine room. The center boilers, which uh, in boiler room two would be B2 and E2, uh, would they would alternate between two and four. So on the in boiler room two, the center boilers went to port, and the uh, and then the center two of boiler room four went to starboard. So you always had six boilers feeding one turbine engine hmm. and then uh and then the same with boiler rooms three and five for the aft engine room the port side boilers fed uh the port engine the starboard side fed the starboard engine and then the middle in boiler room three fed port and the middle two in boiler rooms five in boiler room five fed the starboard and I'm going to take a wild guess here. The reason why they split up the duty in two different rooms on the ship is in case of an accident. 
like let's say a major leak <laughs> that would disable the uh, boilers from one room the redundancies that were available um in case of a situation where you you know you lost a boiler you had a a, a flooding you know a, a, an open compartment to the sea um any situation that would disrupt the normal operating procedure of of how steam was fed to the engine rooms was countermanded by some redundancy you know system and so yes you could you could change you know all the boilers you know to the starboard side you could go to the port side any combination that you wanted there was only one thing that you weren't able to do and that was the the hotel service scotch boilers in boiler room one were were not connected to the main steam so you could you could not feed scotch boiler uh saturated uh dry saturated steam to the turbines not not for propulsion they do there is auxiliary steam that's going to the turbines but we'll talk about that in a minute um so the the hotel service boilers only fed the i shouldn't say only they fed the three turbo generators in the forward turbo generator room the aft turbo generator room was fed by uh the combined main steam of of boiler room five so really yes so the main steam there was a line that came off the main steam uh went to you know re, uh, a um a uh, reducing valve that would you know reduce the pressure down to 230 psi or 250 psi and then uh boiler room fives uh main steam would actually feed off to auxiliary steam to feed the after generator room so does that mean there were two different types of turbo generators depending on which room because one was fed by dry saturated the other was fed by superheated no 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 the um the aft turbo generator room and the forward turbo generator room had uh the same turbo generators in in, in each compartment you just had three in the forward and you had four in the aft but the four and the aft were slightly they their design was with a slight increase in operating pressure so they ran at 250 instead of 230 still dry saturated steam not superheated wow okay okay i see now the the the, the turbo generators in the forward turbo generator room um typically you know sir you know gave electricity for the um you know, for the lights on board, uh, for electric heat, for uh, you know, use in the in the kitchens. Um, I'm trying to think of some other, um, but mainly on board services. Whereas the the four turbo generators in the aft turbo generator room uh, were mainly supplying for the main auxiliaries. Um, you know, pump motors, uh, uh, blower you know, blower fans. Uh, 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 force draft fans, things of that nature. That's what uh, the the four and the after generator room were supplying for electricity. Combined, <laughs> combined, all all seven generators supplied a fifty seven amp service. The Queen Mary currently only gets a forty eight hundred amp service, and she only uses like nineteen hundred amps of wow. of that. Yeah, but she had a fifty fifty seven hundred amps combined service and that was split into 52 substations throughout the ship and then from there they went to different rings you know to serve you know portions of, of each deck but it, yeah it's just incredible the the amount of power that the ship was able to to produce now just to make sure because i i don't want to repeat incorrect information so i'm just going to re like go over this again okay the uh some of the steam from the uh, boiler room one, which was the marine scotch boilers, yeah, uh, is were used for the forward turbo generator room. Correct. 
Okay, and then some of the steam from the uh, the the superheated steam from boiler room five was used to power ah. the after turbo generator room. Right, but went okay. went to a reducing valve. So you when you're reducing the valve. pressure, you're reducing the temperature. It's no longer superheated. Okay. All right. That is pretty cool. That, that's something new that I learned today, folks. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Did All right. We, I think we... Now, I, I guess since we're, we're talking about the auxiliaries, we, we should I should bring into... It is unbelievable what the auxiliary steam was used for. And I, I had actually just learned this myself, was the fact that um, in the turbines... In the main, the main uh, propulsion turbines. Um, imagine you've got this incredible amount of steam pressure inside, and you've got the bearings, right? You've got the shaft that comes out on either end, mm -hmm. and with all that great amount of pressure that's inside the, the inside the turbine from the superheated steam, you would expect then that you would have some kind of a, a steam leakage you would have some some amount that would come through the the bearing itself mm -hmm. so they have these these glands that are packed around the, the bearing that use auxiliary steam that counteract the pressure <laughs> and to prevent <laughs> the superheated steam from leaking out into the atmosphere in, in the, in the engine room, the auxiliary steam was pumped into the casing, into the glands of the bearing glands and would counteract that. And, and then on top of that, there's a vacuum system that's connected to the glands. And this is actually for almost anything auxiliary, anything steam, anything that has a possibility of leaking, any kind of condensation, any any um, you know potential for water to escape, it's collected by vacuum. It's sent to a separator because there was usually oil mixed in with with this water. The oil is separated from the water. The water is then sent to a hot well tank to to get you know preheated, and it goes right back into the system. This is the reason why the Queen Mary had a ninety. 92% efficiency of, of, of fresh water return. So for every 100 gallons going through, 92 gallons would come back. Jeez. That's really efficient considering, you know, this is the technology invented in the 1930s. But, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's mind blowing. And, and <laughs> you and I were having this conversation earlier about information overload, right? Mm-hmm that you know i had that four hour long conversation last night to, to get some you know last minute stuff and my head was pounding because of all of that information overload which is what i'm trying to avoid right now <laughs> it's a it's a lot folks steve and i were talking just just before this live stream about how like you know, sometimes we do get things wrong. You know, I, I will admit that here now I get things wrong on occasion. And it's because, you know, with all this research that I do, all this research that Steve does and, you know, and Rob does, it, it, Rob's uh, Steve and mine's friend, uh, it, you know, all this research that we do, you're, you're just you're, you're just going through so much information. You're doing like, you know, what an AI computer could take seconds to do. And we're going through it hour after hour after hour. You know, and it's so much information, numbers and, you know, and engineering. And, and so sometimes it just sometimes it just gets lost, you know, or sometimes it gets misunderstood or sometimes it contradicts information that you previously thought you knew. You know, before a few minutes ago, I thought the after turbo generator room was entirely its steam was entirely supplied by the marine scotch boilers in boiler room one. So it's things like that. You have to be open to just being like, okay, I was wrong. I got, I've got new information now. This is more accurate, you know? So oh, it's, it's the, a lot. The, the, the other thing we were, we were talking about, about, you know, like saving water was okay. So Queen Mary's in, in Port New York. She needs to take on fuel. So at all the fueling stations, there's not only the place for 
for bunker sea fuel to be brought in to fill the, the the oil bunkers but there's also a a steam feed uh port there and a return port there and the barge would come up you know beside the ship and the barge would plug into the 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 steam feed the auxiliary steam feed and with it a vacuum and and so it would you know if there was any loss of in moisture i think in some of the lines like it would suck that water up and take it back into the into a hot well tank and and it would loop that steam the queen mary would feed steam to the to the um the the, uh, the bunker barge and and heat the oil so that it could easily flow you know out of the barge and then you know and then it would save all that water that was possibly lost it's it's crazy. Oh yeah, you can show a um a fueling station I think on that one. And, yeah, uh, um yeah, they're all on yeah. D deck if I have that right. And uh there's I think six in total. Yes, yeah, the three on the port and three on the starboard. Today the the ones on the port side are gone. There's traces of them, but they're pretty much gone. The ones on the starboard side actually in some degree still exist. You can still see um oil lines with valves and 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 there's steam pressure gauges and stuff like that yeah this is the only one that's labeled on this thing but yeah if, if you go one deck because they're actually two decks high i think if you go to the next deck up you actually see the or did i have that wrong maybe i had that wrong oh wait no, no you might look no. oil filling yeah. station yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's P what the gas gang... means port and starboard wait where'd it go yeah Oh, it went. There we go. Oil filling station. So it says PNS, which means port and starboard, which means that if you see one here, it's, there's another one on this side. And those little stairs, that little stairway that, that's inside that compartment, it, mm -hmm. is, those still exist. At least on the starboard side, they do. Oh, wow. In some. I, I can't think if they're in all three, but um, I think the midship... The midship starboard side is is mostly the one intact. Midship starboard side. That'll be this one. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so shall we talk about the engines? Yes. Yeah. So let's see. Um Okay, let's go back to the boilers for a second and we'll 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 work our way aft from there. So I could talk about the forward engine room and I could talk about the after engine room, but they are virtually identical in, in, in how they functioned, how they're laid out, or at least how the forward engine room is laid out is actually somewhat backwards. And in fact, the turbines themselves are inversed from the turbines in the, in the uh, aft generator, uh, the aft engine room. So because we don't have the forward engine room to reference anymore. I'm going to concentrate on the aft engine room. And you can basically take everything that I, I say about the aft engine room and, and put it into account for the forward engine room as well. If there's any difference, I'll, I'll try and point them out. But um, so, it, you know, I had talked about how the main steam, uh, the main steam lines ran in the up, upper port and starboard uh, forward and aft uh, sections of the boiler rooms and they all run forward and go yeah zoom into the aft engine room well actually you know i was going to say the, the profile one would actually be a little better the profile one uh-huh okay. so yeah perfect okay yeah that's wonderful so you can see the little man on the right hand side, he's standing there, and that's what's what's called the starting platform or, or maneuvering platform. And uh, there's a pipe that kind of does a little swiggly S snake uh, design, correct? And it leads up to the very top on the right hand side, right up against that bulkhead. And that is actually what is going to be the the high pressure steam uh, going to the the turbines, but it's coming from what's known as the maneuvering valve chest. So all those main steam lines that are coming 
on the port and coming on the starboard, they tie into the maneuvering valve chest. So you've got a starboard side maneuvering valve chest and you've got a port side maneuvering valve chest. And when you're when you're in the exhibit hall on Should the, I get a picture of the exhibit hall? Or no, the uh I was gonna say the end the end of the aft engine room because I feel like those pipes are in the photo. Yeah. Um well actually if you've got the one from the exhibit hall that shows the actual chest because when they made the when they made the upper level of the exhibit hall over the uh aft engine room, they actually made a little balcony, a little open section where you can actually see the uh, the maneuvering valve chest. And I I would love to go take a picture of it, but I can't I I couldn't find one to to show. Do you do you, do you know this area that I'm talking about? I I don't know. No. Uh, well, let's go. Go ahead and show that starting the the, the starting platform uh, picture that I gave you, and then we'll, okay. we can work from that. Just yeah, yeah, that one. Can you show any more of the top? Can it? Does it go above? That's uh, that's, that's as far as it goes. Okay. So. So you've got on the left, you've got the port side main uh, high pressure steam, and on the right, you've got the uh, you've got the starboard side high pressure steam, and those are each coming from their uh, their maneuvering valve chests. Um, now, the the chest itself has three valves, so we'll we'll pick the port side one. We'll talk about the port side one for now. So. There are three valves that are affiliated with that chest. And zoom in to the three valve wheels on the port side. Ah. So you can see here, which Rob very nicely numbered for me, is 10, 11, and 12. Oh, yeah, Rob did these, didn't he? The, yeah. All these plaques. Yeah, he did. He designed them and installed them in 96, I believe, and they're still there today. And and what's even more amazing is the fact that they were never, like, graffiti, damaged, vandalized. They're still in, in really perfect condition. Uh, so we've got these three valves. The, uh, the one on the right, we'll start off with number 10. That is the that is the main maneuvering valve. So that is uh, what is going to um, give you uh, a, a head maneuvering throttle on the port side aft engine. So the the uh, you know it's, it's going from a complete a complete shutoff. If you open it wide open, you're talking 425 PSI, 700 degree steam. Now, the two other valves, oops. I was just showing that oh, that, yeah. uh, that valve controls this right. engine. That's, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, I'll move this out of the way. No. Okay, so the other two valves are your, your uh, main ahead shutoff and your astern shutoff. So you're either going to have a head or you're going to have a stern. And I see. So this would pretty much almost always be open to allow steam into the the area, but then these would control whether the steam goes forward or Right. So you're always controlling you're always controlling the throttle uh, the 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 amount of revolutions of the propeller by the maneuvering throttle. But you're either going to have the ahead valve open for moving at you know moving forward, or you would close the ahead valve and you would open the astern valve and then again use the maneuvering valve to produce uh, a, an astern motion, a, a backward motion, and that's how you're going to control between going forward and going going astern. Nice. And so it's then, almost like the gas pedal, and then you got the uh, two different the, gears. The clutch. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, clutch. The clutch. 
Yeah, that is basically kind of, of how it's set up. Yeah, that's and 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 it's repeated again on the starboard side, and and again in the forward engine room. The forward engine room also had a a similar starting platform like this, and and the same the same setup was there as well. It's a little slightly differently arranged. It's a little more compressed in the forward engine room, or was you know in her service days, but. Yeah, because folks, the <clears throat> you can see here the two different engine rooms. We were talking about the aft engine room, which is the only one that's kind of intact today. Uh, but then the forward engine room was kind of a different layout because they had more space, so they kind of pushed things around different ways. Now you would you would think that you know there's a lot more wide open space in this you know this uh, you know looking down deck plan of mm -hmm. of uh, G deck, but but actually there's a lot of there's a lot of machinery that is filling that that void, and mm -hmm. and the actual starting platform was smaller in the uh, in the forward uh, engine room than it was even in the aft engine room. Would the starting platform in the forward engine room have been here up against the aft engine room? <sighs> the reason why I ask is because there's an airlock here, and then uh, also probably because you'd think that they'd want to compile all the no, it was on the aft. It was on the forward bulkhead. Oh, on the forward bulkhead. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But it, for example, in in the on that aft bulkhead of the forward engine room, going into the forward bulkhead of the uh, uh, a forward bulkhead of the aft engine room, um, that space there was where the the main condenser pumps w were located. They were just on. Mm -hmm. Just on either side of uh, of the uh, the airlock there, and actually that you see that that um, that little square uh, black uh, image right, yeah, right there, yeah, that's that's an elevator. An oh, an elevator. Yeah, or a lift. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that would take you up the the engine room skylight. Um, oh, you know, I think. Uh... Oh, I I thought there w it would have shown in here, but I guess not. Sometimes on this cutaway they show elevators, so. Yeah, yeah, I don't think or it shows it on that. All right, well, back to the. Uh... Okay. Uh, let's see. So you've got basically a little bit of a of the drawing of the propeller shafts. So, uh, yeah, yes, let's zoom into the aft engine room. Uh, we'll primarily talk about that there then. So the pink areas there, that is one engine. But there mm -hmm. are actually six turbines per engine. There are four visible that, y that you see. However, the... Uh, the second intermediate and the low pressure turbines are are actually two turbines in one, and they are the astern turbines. Uh, the second intermediate pressure turbine, which is on the the inner one, so go down to the next one next to it. Yeah, so that's the second intermediate pressure turbine. That is the high pressure astern turbine. Just to make sure that everybody knows, it the, what he means is that this turbine is, well, this turbine set is capable of going forward and reverse, as opposed to, let's say, the high pressure ahead, which only goes high pressure ahead. Right. Now, they will spin in either direction. And mm -hmm. when, when you go, when you're uh, moving a stern... Um, the the other turbines, the ahead turbines, will spin in reverse, and actually, oh, wow. they they don't waste that energy. They they in fact they sometimes even will they, they would shut down like a high pressure turbine. Um, in fact, the big black handle, you know, when you're walking down into into the aft engine room, and you're on that bottom level, and you're walking between the turbines, and and just aft of the of the gearbox is a big black handled valve and it's on the um you know it comes up from the floor and so like the 
the handrail kind of goes around it, but you just yeah, see this footage. big. Ah, let me see. Um, I think it's uh, this might have sound at first, but I'll mute it as soon as it. Uh, mute that. How do I? Okay, there we go. And then let me just resize this so it fits in the screen. Should there. Um, so this is this is I'm already in the engine room at this point, but uh, we're kind of heading down. So hold on, let's see. So now we make a left. Uh, sorry, I'm looking. Yeah, you're at the you're on the right. Yeah, you're right on the the right level. Yeah, you're gonna mm -hmm. turn to your left. So you're walking so, between the two second intermediate pressure turbines right now. Mm -hmm. That's the one on the starboard, and the red one, which is missing its outer uh, jacketing, is uh, is the port side second intermediate. So okay, so if you did, did I just see it, what you were talking about there? Um, yeah, the red. Uh huh. Yeah. So that big red handle, the big red wheel, goes to a valve, and that valve actually will disengage the 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 high pressure. I think it, it disengages the high pressure turbine, so that the second intermediate. See, I, boy, I'm, I'm I wasn't planning on talking about this, but. <laughs> There was a way for you to cut out the high pressure turbine. And then the high pressure turbine would just be free spinning and but but isolated from from steam. It, it, the that valve by, does a bypass and so it brings in um oh golly, I can, now I can't remember exactly how this goes. This is why I didn't want to talk about this. Um <laughs> the there was a well. Let's just put it this way: there was a way for you to bypass like the high pressure turbine and use it as a vacuum pump. Oh wow! Because, what would the vacuum have been used for? Uh, for air ejection. Like and 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 gland sucking, you know, and and you know, there were some. There were lots of reasons why. I, and this is where I don't know enough information to really even go into it, but. It was Fair possible. Enough. We'll just we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so um, now, the, when you walk into the aft engine room today, unfortunately, you can't really get an idea of where all the steam lines went because half of them are gone mm -hmm. because they were in the way of the the guest catwalks. You know, so you. Um, so the, the line that goes from the from the high pressure to the to the first intermediate, I don't know the high pressure to first intermediate is there, but I think the high the first intermediate to second intermediate is gone. In fact, um, in fact, the opening for the second intermediate, no, the opening for the first intermediate on the port side is open it's the it's the one where you can actually like there's a light inside and you can see it's the exhaust from the first intermediate and it comes down the, the, the line would actually originally come down and you get drops below the catwalk that you you're walking on and it goes to that valve oh wow I believe that's yeah. So, like, where I'm walking in this video, there probably would have been other machinery, other pipes. Well, and and, and not to way. mention not to mention the fact that 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 you're only seeing like a portion of the upper part of the condenser. The condenser has been cut. All right, because they put the floor of the lobby up above. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The D deck level is is taking up was taking up the space, and they they wanted the actual deck space, so they cut the tops of the condensers. And we lost, I think, about 10 feet or 12 feet of, of the Yeah, cause, because, you know, I was telling people, like, these engine rooms were, like, five decks high. And it, it when you walk in it today, you wouldn't think so. And that's because the, the lobby does take up part of that original ceiling height. Yeah, and, well, yeah, well, they went at least, let's see, G... D F E D. Well, at least three to four decks high, and it was in tiers because there were some areas where it was not quite as tall 
in, in, in space than than other. But as you got to the center, you had the engine room skylight that went all the way up, mm-hmm. all the way up to you know to signal deck, where you had the engine room, the the, the engine room hatch, and the skylight windows. So when you looked up, I don't. Do you have a photograph? Of I have that? a picture of that. I'm actually yeah. gonna pull that up right now. Um, I think it's under. Where is it? Deck plans. I, I I wish that the aft engine room skylight could oh. be reinstated, just purely for the 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 view, to be able to look up that high inside that machinery space and see you know blue sky in the uh, you know from the skylight windows. Um, was was an, it, I think it was a really awe striking view now that i'm looking for the darn picture now i can't find it i had it just a minute ago i was like oh maybe i should show this today and it should be in this well well, i'll open this photograph for now because i think this is cool this is a a picture of uh the engineers actually operating those valves that you were talking about earlier yeah yeah that's the aft engine room uh, starting platform Jeez, where the heck was it? See, I could have sworn it was in this. Or maybe, oh, maybe it was here. Let me see. Found it. This uh, this is labeled for, hold on, wait. Open it up. This is labeled forward engine room hatch. Oh, yeah, there we go. So all those little pipes, like I was mentioning about air ejectors, like, so you're wondering, okay, so it's ejecting air. Like, where does where does the air go? And the air ejectors, I'll explain here in a little bit, but I was always wondering, where, where does the air go if you're ejecting the air um, out of whatever system you're ejecting it from? Well, it would travel up those up those pipes to to an outside vent Mm -hmm. i was wondering you know exactly you know why do you have a million pipes of various sizes traveling you know vertically all the way up to the top deck well that that would be the reason why looks like it could be like a set from an alien movie you know like ridley scott (laughs) and, and what's funny is is that this engine room skylight that you're seeing is for all practical purposes, it's all intact on each deck level, and, and in some cases in multiple deck levels where it, it isn't decked off. It's only decked mm. off. Um, let's see, our deck. Let's see, our deck. Uh, our deck, prom deck, and then the cap. On the, I can't remember. Let's see, one's different than the other. But what's interesting is, is that in the main kitchens, let's see, I, well, I don't have the, the, the drawing, but whatever engine room hatches is, is most adjacent to the main kitchens on on our deck. They took the engine room hatch. And and it's decked off there for whatever reason they 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 decked it off there, but they utilized it for the main kitchens. And so, at least you know years ago, it was what was referred to as the silver room. So any kind of silver trays, you know, serving uh, terrines, you know, things of that nature, would all be stored in this room. But if you walked into that room, you could look all the way up the prom deck, and it, you'd see the the outer perimeter of the original engine room hatch and it still has lights and catwalks and you know they're not working lights but 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 you can see where lights were um you know at least you see the i think either i think there's even some with a globe there's actually like a, a glass globe on them um but there's, there's portions of catwalks there's portions of of those pipes that you can see in the photograph and uh you know if there was a way to remove the prom deck and the r deck uh, things and then and then remove the cap and build a replica skylight. You could easily put the uh, the interim hatch back. 
I think it's the forward engine room hatch that's actually more intact than the aft engine room hatch because the aft engine room hatch is a is a power station. So I think it's like you know it's R A R A prom and then the cap. So on each level there, there are transformers, electrical transformers that that convert. 480 volts to 240 volts and then then from 480 to 120 and from there it's distributed to that area you know so a deck gets a distribution which covers b deck and then and then prom deck covers uh main deck prom deck and and sun deck and i wanted to mention to folks because you're probably wondering what happened if they if they removed the engines <clears throat> out of the forward engine room and they, they did convert this plus uh, boiler room five and part of the after turbo generator room into a big convention center. Right. Uh, there were propeller shafts obviously running through the aft engine room into the forward engine room. And I do have a photograph of what the um, what what those propeller shafts look like today inside the. Uh, the forward, what used to be the forward engine room, but now is the convention space. So this is the propeller shaft. And if you were to look inside, cause it is hollow. I, I didn't know this till I found these pictures, but the inside of the propeller shaft is hollow. And it so makes, you can, it makes the coolest noise in the world when you like clap your hands or make a noise. <laughs> it, it, it has an echo chamber, an echo chamber of, of great proportion. It just sounds so cool. And, uh, and the, and the crazy thing about that is, so, hanging on the bulkheads in multiple areas were all of the tools needed to uh, to disengage a portion of a propeller shaft or to remove a propeller shaft. And when they came on board, you know, during the, the early days of the conversion, one one of the things that they needed to do was actually disengage the propellers from the reduction gear box so that that gave the coast guard the um it satisfied the coast guard to let them know that this ship is no longer a functional vessel mm -hmm. um but they had to do it within a certain period of time i think it was i think they gave them a week they had one week from december the 9th to they had to disengage the propeller shafts they had to disengage they had to make unusable the hydraulic steering ram and there was something else i think it had to do with the um uh with the uh no because that would be with part of the steering ram there was another thing that there were, i think there were three things that that the the u.s coast guard because they were otherwise they were going to have to re-register the ship yeah as a as a ship yeah as a and ship which would have they would have had to find find a flag of convenience because they wouldn't have been able to register it in the United States. They'd have to pick a flag of convenience country, and then then the ship would have to meet those that country's you know uh, standards for 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 maritime, and yeah, it would have been a big mess. So they had to complete it all within a week, and but they were probably down there with flashlights because it, the ship was on minimal power, and. Mm -hmm didn't find the tools which are basically they're, just, they're like ratchet wrenches you know they're still hanging up in the aft engine room they're still on the bulkheads today big really? big big ratchet wrenches to oh, wow. remove the the nuts on the back see that's a flange that that b b big black thing on the outer edge is a flange and mm -hmm. that's where one portion of propeller shaft connects to another and on the back side are nuts and so all you need to do was get, you know, grab the, the ratchet tool and, you know, I, you know, there was other stuff that went with it because you needed like a little bit of a come along with it. Um, but um, a, a, a persuader bar, that's what I call them, a persuader bar. You're <laughs> going to persuade that nut to come off. Um, but they didn't see it. So they came on board with oxyacetylene torches and they cut the propeller shaft off with the acetylene torch you and can actually see the rough cuts yeah, right they must have felt really stupid <laughs> they must have because because this propeller shaft is several inches thick right you, know? so you, you went through a lot of gas to to 
to cut that. And that when I'm sure somebody at some point finally saw the the tools, and and that was a big don't moment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we should get back to the uh, the should, turbines. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's go back to the deck plan one. I think we can go from there. I just want to. I just want to give some some figures because it's really kind of hard to. So the high pressure ahead turbine is the very first turbine to receive steam from the boilers. So that big snaky pipe that you saw in the in the engine room photo leads i think it goes behind the the condenser comes around and and the high pressure turbines are the outer uh aft turbines so no that's no what the out yeah. on this side yeah yeah so that's the high pressure oh. port and then if you go to the other one on the other side that's the high pressure starboard no yeah right there yeah high pressure starboard okay. so the those lines are coming in there and they are 16 and a half inches in diameter coming in and from that point, it's not quite 400. It's like 390, you know, it's, it's really close. But, you know, that would vary, of course, depending upon what the output of the boilers are. If you're really demanding for, you know, you're, you're going to be some kind of a flank speed order. Um, you're exceeding the normal operating limits. And, and I, I just had this conversation about whether or not the Queen Mary ever did 38 knots there's no official documentation that's been found showing 38 plus knots in speed but it's been documented by verbal testimony numerous times particularly by um ron winner so there's no his... like abstract log with it on there we think that lloyd's possibly has it because lloyd's would have been on board during her sea trials and we know from Ron Winter, where you know it's pretty determined that she must have done thirty-eight plus knots. He was going by by a visual uh, aid to to determine her speed. But there was a there was a person on my channel who commented. They said that they saw an abstract log with uh, thirty-eight knots on it, um, and it was dated for the war, obviously. And when I when he said that, I was like. That's exactly what Steve told me that yeah. there was an abstract log with right. that on there, but nobody can find it. So, so Rob and I met this guy. In, oops, I didn't mean to put my mic. Um, Rob and I met this guy in '96, I think it was '96, '97, um, named Jim May, who worked worked as an engineer for Cunard during during World War II, and he did actually have an abstract. Um, I don't know if it was personal log or. Or what? But 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 documenting on numerous occasions, uh, the Queen Mary could could very easily have a burst of of speed, thirty eight up to maybe even thirty nine knots, and, and I would assume that it could even go higher than that. But with the speed came the use of fuel, mm -hmm. and when she would reach those speeds. You could visually look at the fuel levels in the tanks, in the in the main fuel tanks, and watch the level of oil lower and lower and lower. That's that's an incredible amount of fuel being wasted for those extra knots. But during the war, I'm sure there were some situations where it was necessary. And mm -hmm. and then during her sea trials, for a brief period of time, uh, it was also uh, you know something that they wanted to do to to see where her limitations were. Mm -hmm. uh, in during World War II, uh, Jim May was telling us that when she had to do those bursts of speed, the, the orders were given to uh, the staff working in the. Uh, I, well, I, let's see. I'm trying to think. Yeah, that was still third class dining room. I think the officers section. I think it was still used as an uh, for officers on board for dining room. But the the 
deadlights, which are the the cast um, the cast steel plates that would fit over the portholes, so that mm-hmm. in case you know in case you had a wave come up and break the glass, it, it wouldn't flood into the ship. Um, the deadlights had to be closed and secured in the third class dining room because the wake from the bow was reaching the portholes <laughs> in the third class dining room when she was oh reaching that speed. That, that, that's another mind blowing moment because you're up on our deck. You know, that's you're pretty high up on the ship from, from, you know, from yeah. uh, her waterline. Cause uh, the waterline is pretty much at the floor of E deck. So yeah. it's like, it's like you can imagine a wake coming up all the way to our deck to the portholes just from the ship going that fast. Jeez. Yeah, and, and, and to give the order to clo- to to secure the deadlights. I mean, you know, it's one thing to just have lapping water to, or spray, but but the wake was actually coming up that high to where they were basically submerged <laughs> from, uh, from the bow wake. That's, oh my gosh, unbelievable. And those windows, those uh, por- specifically the portholes below, I think it is below B deck. Those portholes specifically have a glass that's designed to withstand something like 9,000 pounds of pressure, which I, I was still researching it, but I think that's, it's incredible. That glass is really strong. So to want to put the deadlights on tells you something about well, what they I mean, were expecting. If you look at the glass, even in the, in the first class cabins, you know, that are now the, you know, the hotel rooms used today, that glass is still like, one inch thick Mm -hmm. you know you're you're, and it's 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 um it's uh laminated tempered glass so it's you know even if it cracks it's it's not going anywhere yeah anyways yeah okay let's (laughs) it was cool to to learn though yeah okay so we're gonna so uh, from the uh from that Forward, or I'm sorry, from that aft outer turbine, the the high speed. I'm sorry, the high speed, the high pressure turbine. Um, let me pull some facts here up really quick. Um, I was trying to, I wanted to blow everybody's mind away by the amount of blades, the amount of stages, and I just kept looking and looking and looking. And I know it's out there. I, I in fact, I had Rob even looking for it, and and it's. It's out there as far as like the amount of stages and the amount of blades. I've got dimensions of, of diameters of blades, um, but on the on the high pressure turbines, and this would be all equal for all four uh, all four high speed high speed high pressure turbines. So the two in the forward tur- uh, the forward engine room and the two in the aft engine room are all identical. The entire assembly of of the engines themselves, you know, the with all the turbines combined, they're they're basically identical. And as far as I know, um, they were identical on the Queen Elizabeth. There wouldn't be much of any reason to have changed that. I, I've not seen any noticeable changes with the uh, installation of the ones on the Queen Elizabeth. Um. Let's see here. Pull some information up. Uh, let's see here. So the high the high pressure turbine is a impulse reaction turbine. So you're getting superheated steam in through the the inlet that goes into a chest, which is directed into a total of actually thirty five nozzles. If I yeah. 35 nozzles and those nozzles are all they're all built in to the casing of the turbine so the steam is actually brought into the casing uh it's directed into a nozzle uh, which will aim towards the the blades in a particular angle and and uh pitch and uh 
but there's 35 of them total, so they're scattered about. So they're not just in the first stage. They're not at the very beginning of the of the turbine, but they actually vary uh, through the imp. There, I think there's three. There's either two or three impulse rows or stages, and and then because it's an an impulse reaction turbine, by that time you've lost you've lost that temperature, you've lost a little bit of pressure. You're no longer really superheated by that point. You're starting to get to that that dry saturation. So the blades actually change in design and they they grow larger to the reaction type blades. And let's see if I post more information. Uh okay, two impulse two impulse stages, eight reaction stages. And the steam line actually leaves. Remember, it was 16 and a half inches when it came in. Mm -hmm. When it leaves the, the high pressure turbine, it's 19 and a half inches to the first intermediate turbine. And this is where we, these are what are called quadruple expansion engines. So we're, at, we're expanding the, the uh, volume which lowers the pressure and lowers the temperature. So every time we go to another engine and an, another turbine, we expand. So we're, we're, we're gaining volume, but we're losing pressure and we're losing uh, temperature. Well, I but, do have a question about yes. that. Okay. Just to make doubly sure. Just, but so of course the, these deck plans I'm looking at are probably not very accurate but what it does show in here is that the high pressure um ahead and the and the uh, first intermediate pressure ahead are mm -hmm. similar sizes yeah uh, yeah the, what, the, they they aren't <laughs> they aren't in real life they're no. the, the first intermediate's bigger uh first intermediate would be slightly larger it, it's not very okay. much larger but it is slightly larger yeah Okay. Okay. So okay, then that 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 does satisfy my question that it truly is quadruple expansion. In, in fact, I can tell you this right now. Um, oh no, I can't because I don't have the dimensions of the high pressure. Yeah, I don't have the dimensions of the high pressure blades. Um, the first intermediate. Okay, so now we've gone now to nineteen and a half inches. The line from the high pressure to the first intermediate, and we're down to now like, oh golly, it was it was it was a significant drop. Um, I think it's like like two hundred and eighty psi. Um, I'm not sure what the temperature would be, but it's it's um, uh, it's definitely in a dry saturation stage from this point. Um, I don't have the blade dimensions for the high pressure, but the first intermediate was six stages of, this is an all reaction turbine, six stages, five and a quarter inch length blades up to 11 and a half inch blades. So, uh, so you're talking about 11 and a half plus 11 and a half plus the diameter of the, of the shaft of the, of the rotor itself, which I believe was, no, I don't have that figure with me. It's pretty good size. I, I, it might be 19, 20 inches, somewhere like that. So that would give you the dimension of uh, of uh, of the first intermediate. Um, just taking a step back really quick, the high pressure turbine just by itself at standard operating pressures at, at full speed would be 9,600 horsepower. The, the first intermediate is 8200 horsepower and when the steam leaves the first intermediate to go to the second intermediate it now leaves the first intermediate in a 31 inch diameter uh, uh, pipe to the inlet of the second intermediate so we've now almost doubled our, our volume and it's also lost it's now down to 
Second intermediate, I believe, is only like eighty four psi. It's 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 in the eighties or maybe near a hundred. Um. Uh, and the second intermediate, I also don't have blade dimensions on. Uh, but the second intermediate produced ten thousand six hundred uh, shaft horsepower. Um. Let's see. Do I have dimensions on? No, I don't. So from the second intermediate uh, turbine, we go to the low pressure turbine, and that line is a sixty inch, six zero inch 60. diameter uh, eject outlet from the second intermediate to the inlet of the low pressure, and the. Uh, Let's see, the uh, forward end of both the high pressure, I'm sorry, of the second intermediate and the low pressure turbines are the astern turbines. So they actually, the, the, those little caps there, yeah, yeah, those are the, the astern turbines. And they actually have their own separate uh, inlet, uh, steam inlet. Okay. So when they are not being fed steam for a stern, oh yeah, good. I'm glad you brought this up. Um, but when the stern turbines are not, yet, so okay, you brought this up. I'll bring this up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> I know in a previous video I was talking about. Um, I think somebody had asked a question about how does how does the Queen Mary go a stern, and it brought up. Um, well, this is you know a. a directional flow turbine one direction is is forward and the other is a stern totally totally wrong on that this is a direction this is a divided flow uh rotor and the steam is actually introduced in the middle there but for a head so all these big blades that you see starting from the smallest in the center going to the largest on the left and right that's all a head the astern turbine blades are actually on the other side, and they were in a completely separate chamber of the turbine. So when the astern turbines are not running astern, they are, they are vacuum pumps. Mm. Yeah, so this was, yeah, I have to thank uh, Antonio for, um, for bringing that up to us. Because, uh, you know, even for the longest time, I thought that, you know, because this was uh, two directional, I thought it was, you know, one side was high pressure. The other was was uh, or I'm sorry, one one side was um, was forward. The other was reverse. Yeah. But it is a a head. Um, but <laughs> two, yeah. two it divided, you know. Yeah. Divided flow. The divided flow. Divided rotor. flow. Yeah. But that, and but and that where that guy astern. is on the right, see where that guy is on the very right, he mm -hmm. is right next to on the other side of him would be the astern turbine. Yep, and it's all connected to the same assembly, so it's yep. all it's technically cap. like all one piece. But right now, yeah, those but, now those all those ahead blades that you see, um, there are twenty rows of blades, 10, 10 to the left and ten to the right. And they vary in lengths between five and five eighths inch and sixteen and a quarter inch. The the ahead turbine produces eleven thousand one hundred horsepower. The astern turbine, which is really small in comparison, produces ten thousand eight hundred horsepower. And the second intermediate turbine, which has the high pressure astern. Is also I I couldn't get a figure for it, but it is also like like b near ten thousand horsepower. So it's about twenty thousand horsepower astern is what she could do, and and at full speed astern, her propellers were doing one hundred and eighty revolutions per minute. Uh, nobody seems to know if or what her determined you know, maximum a stern speed was because I can't find any documentation that it was ever done in her sea trials. And she, she obviously did a stern maneuvers in her sea trials, but 
not a max speed uh, situation. As far as as far as we know, uh, they probably had you know she must do a certain speed a stern to to be accepted by Cunard, which is you know maybe fifteen knots, twenty knots. Um, I don't I don't know what it would be, but you know for example like we know that the United States did a maximum speed a stern test. Well, that was probably because the Navy was also wanting to know what her limitations were. And, and the United States obviously proved that she could do a stern speeds, you know, well in excess of 20 knots. Um, so yeah. So the queen Mary, we don't know what her maximum a stern speed could be. But 180, 180 revolutions per minute, a 20,000 horsepower, I would assume that she could at least do 20 knots a stern. Mm -hmm. That would be my guess. And for those looking at the screen, this is a, a, a view into... Ah, yes! Yeah, this is the second intermediate... Uh, let's see, what does the sign... The sign's down here. I, so believe that's the, the I believe that's the I believe that's the out first inner. Yeah, that's oh, the exhaust, the outlet. So that is the 31 inch, and it's oval. It's not round. It's oval, 31 inch uh, diameter outlet or exhaust that would go into the. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the first intermediate that would go to the second intermediate uh, turbine. Now the the um, the low pressure turbine just it is directly adjacent to the condenser, and it did not have an outlet. You know that that had a pipe that coming out. It it actually directly flowed up into the condenser itself. And by the time steam reached the condenser, uh, it was only uh, twenty psi. Wow, only twenty. And the condenser would would cool the the uh, exhaust steam down to eighty four degrees of standing water at the bottom of the well in the condenser. Now you know Titanic's uh, steam when it when it went into the uh, um, the um, turbine, the steam turbine was nine psi going into the turbine right uh is is there a reason that uh when the steam leaves queen mary's uh low pressure turbine it's still at 20 psi that seems like they could have used that steam pressure for something else like you know the ships often try to get every last ounce of pressure out of it you know it's it's possible i i don't know i'm not enough of of a of an engineer to, to tell you, you know, you know, the, the think of how big the Titanic's low pressure turbine was mm -hmm. to squeeze that little bit out and to take up that much weight and that much space. Probably they, they realized that they, you know, to add another low pressure turbine, you, you could have possibly added another low pressure turbine, a, a, a second low pressure turbine. Um, but you know with that comes the weight and and you also have uh um uh, you know the resistance you know of 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 it in the in the reduction gear so i i, I think from my own personal thought that that's probably what they concluded was that you've reached 20 psi and you know we're just going to cool it back to water and, and be done with it I would love to hear other people's opinions if anybody's got any opinions on it because it goes out of it's beyond my my pay grade. <laughs> That's all right, Steve. <laughs> we do what we can. So uh, this is pretty much about it. I just wanted to touch base on the water. Um, so we've we've now converted that all that steam back into water in the condenser and. And it's 84 degrees at the bottom of the well in the condenser. So 
when you are reintroducing water back into the boilers and to the into the water feed system, uh, you are not going to want to add cold water. It's going to be it would be too much of a shock to the boilers. So you actually want to heat it up. So from the uh, oh, and I was also talking about um, air ejectors. So there's air ejectors that are connected to that well tank of the evap of the uh, condenser, and that was to help not only draw remaining steam into you know the the condenser uh, chamber itself, but um, uh, it's also lowering it's also lowering temperature. Remember, I told you there's always a pressure temperature. Uh, relation with each other so if you bring down the temperature if you bring down the pressure um you're also going to help lower the temperature mm -hmm. so the opposite you know if you bring down the temperature bring down the pressure the opposite is true if you increase temperature <laughs> i got this backwards if you increase <laughs> pressure you're going to increase temperature so uh and, and vice versa if you increase temperature you will also increase pressure so from the the well of the condenser it would go through a series of uh of course it would go into a low pressure low pressure preheat uh pump uh and it, it, it would first go through an extraction pump to a to a low pressure uh uh heat 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 well or a hot well tank and then uh from there it's it goes to a um an intermediate uh setup and then it would go to what they call a high pressure um, high pressure turbo feed pump so it's increasing not only the temperature which it increases the water uh, let's see here leaves the extraction pump leaves the extraction pumps 115 degrees I'm reading this from my, my notes here um, the low pressure feed water heater is 220 degrees Goes to and there is an intermediate, and I'm not going to give the intermediate, but the turbo feed pump, when it leaves the turbo feed pump, and then it goes to the high the high pressure feed water heater. It's 425 degrees. I'm sorry, 425 psi at 370 degrees. So remember, if you increase pressure, you increase temperature, but it's still water. Remember, mm -hmm. at sea level, at normal atmospheric pressure, water boils at 212 degrees. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so if you increase the pressure to 425 PSI, you can keep water at 370 degrees and still be water. So I'm, so I'm going to say they, they needed to increase the pressure of the feed water to to uh, 425 psi just so that way when they open a valve to let the water into the boiler the water would not reverse yes. out so of the, the boiler the, the 425 psi 370 degree temperature water feed was what the the main boilers operated on so when water was introduced into the steam drums and into the tubes into the boilers that's what it would be at was, was 370 degrees 425 psi um and the last little bit of information I wanted to give was the amount of water. Um, the main uh, boilers, the 24 main boilers of the Queen Mary would produce 1,925,000 I'm sorry, 920,000 pounds of steam per hour. That equates to 16 tons of steam per minute. I love that song. You get 16 tons. What do you get? Uh, uh, the Queen Mary movie is what you get. Um, that's 239,600 gallons of water per hour. Jeez. Yeah. That is a lot. And that, my friends, concludes part two. Do we have time wow. for any any any? Yeah, folks, if you have if you have questions left over about the engines or the propulsion 
let us know. I will try to answer questions that are not related. I mean, we have time right now. Why don't we answer this? Uh, Dub asks, uh, this has nothing to do with engines, by the way, just so you're prepared. Yeah. Um, Dub asks, did they use salt seawater to cool the ship via air conditioning and for the boilers? I assume they had to store fresh water for boilers prior to voyage. Yes. Okay. So the, to answer the second part of the question first, yes. Fresh water was stored on board, um, brought on board uh, in Southampton. Um, let's see. Was it Southampton? And I think it was Southampton and New York. I think they took on fresh water. But um, the ship had the ability to make fresh water as well um, in, in a limited capacity. But um, but the primary source for fresh water was brought on board pr prior to sailing. To answer the first question, absolutely yes. All all uh, all air conditioning and refrigeration condensers were uh, uh, used seawater uh, for uh, for condensing purposes. Uh, but uh, this is the reason why the Queen Mary sucked at doing cruising and why she sucked at her last great cruise being unbearable for for some of the passengers because she was going down into the south atlantic in what would be our winter time it's summertime in the south atlantic and the temperature of the south atlantic and into the south pacific is warm very warm above her normal operating seawater temperatures so some seas could be like 90 degrees Fahrenheit. oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. and so you're pumping warm seawater into the ship to the air conditioning to the refrigeration systems that um that need that that you know they're designed for north atlantic cold water and so they didn't cool properly and you didn't have really functioning air conditioning or or very well you know uh you know performing mm -hmm. air conditioning there was a a passenger because the the heat was so overwhelming they they saw the passenger in the first class main lounge so then they, they they saw the captain in the first class main lounge the passenger approached the captain said captain what, what rooms are air conditioned i just need to get out of this heat the captain looked at them and said you're in one yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well and i think i i think the majority there's a really good book to find um called three stacks and you're out and I, I forget who the author was but it was written by um i think it was written by several different because there's different chapters i think written by different passengers who sailed on the on the last great cruise to long beach and and it tells them a lot of these little stories that um that went along you know during that 39 days and uh i think for the most part if you read these stories the passengers had a good time no matter what they they understood the situation they understood the conditions and they made the best of it um during those you know hot nights you know because in the nighttime even when the sun was down you got a little bit of reprieve from the from the sun but the interiors of the ship were still fairly warm and did not aerate as as well so a lot of passengers spent the night on deck chairs outside I have to uh, move on to another question. Uh, uh, Wild Jared says, what is a cross compound steam turbine? Okay, so now we're we're getting into. Does this have to do with uh, with this it, it uh, has... this page here? No, no. no. So, OK, uh, and, and I better give a better example if i can give you a picture i might be able to give you a picture of it um yes i'm googling <laughs> right, because i don't have it you... i wasn't expected to, to bring this up but well you look at that i'll see if i can answer this question yeah uh carl trotter says out of interest how much noise did the engines make and was the queen ever reported to vibrate i know she was known to dash the Atlant uh, atlantic with a bone in her mouth so were there bow vibrations well 
The Queen Mary did, uh, in her first years, experience some pretty intense vibrations. At first, they thought it was purely because of the brand new turbine engines, which there is some truth that one of the turbines was producing vibrations, but the majority of the vibrations had to do actually with the propellers, and it has to do something with something called cavitation. I have a video all about that on my channel. Um, it's called um, When the Ocean Liners Vibrated. And uh, it, you can look that up on the playlist. Um, uh, I think I think it's like just Ocean Liner's playlist, and you'll see it's a it's a painting of Mauritania vibrating, and so um, that explains kind of how the the cavitations work and the propellers, and it also explains a little bit about what happened to the Queen Mary. They did eventually stiffen the Queen Mary's stern decks to prevent them from shaking so harshly, and then eventually her propellers were replaced in 1938, which is what won her the blue ribbon for the final time against Normandy. Um, so that was that. And then as for the noise, how much noise do the engines make? It was pretty loud. It was said that... Uh, that in order for one crewman to get another crewman's attention in the engine room, they would have to bang a hammer or a tool or something on the railing to get their attention because no amount of screaming could do it. <laughs> and that's also why the ship had something called loudophones. So uh, if the bridge needed to call, like actually call one of the engine rooms, they had special phones called loudophones that were designed to cancel out the noise of the engine room so that way the bridge could hear the person speak. So I hope that satisfies, um, well, I, and your last question about bow vibrations, I do not know about bow, 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 bow vibrations. vibrations. Um, I know that when, you know, when, when her well deck was submerged, on, on occasion that um that the breaking of the of the of the bow wave would create a a a vibration i don't know to what degree um which is why i think that when when they designed queen elizabeth i think that's why they they did away with the well deck mm -hmm. um i know that in her first, in her early years, second class cabins and, and the second class accommodations and the crew accommodations that were just literally above the, like the aft engine room, um, suffered terrible vibration um, at certain points when the ship would reach certain speeds. And so they actually went in to those areas in, in on multiple deck levels and and strengthen the the decks in between decks by adding you know steel columns um i don't know if they ever fully took care of all of the vibration issues um i know that uh you know when you would be when she would roll and you had you know terrible swell conditions that um uh, it was your teeth would literally be shaken out of you <laughs> when a, a a screw was exposed to the air mm. because they would yeah. suddenly rev up and and but we were just i was just reading with this with rob was that the the turbines actually have a an overspeed an, an over rev shutdown like if if they start to spin above a certain amount of speed it will shut them down completely so it won't let them spin out of control which is a good thing um but it would be just enough in the beginning um to where you didn't have the you didn't have the uh um the stabilization of the water in, in that area of the ship for one because you've got the the stern exposed and it would just literally you know just shake the daylights out of you what did you find on cross compound steam turbines so, so this is getting out of again out of my pay grade but it it has to do with splitting up the steam um it's uh, well I'll, i mean I, I this is probably the best thing is it's compounding compounding is the splitting up into two or more stages of steam pressure or velocity change through a turbine um so you're actually it sounds like you're actually creating like multiple stages 
well, in this case, you've got high pressure, medium, you know, intermediate, first intermediate, second intermediate, and low pressure turbines. Whereas a cross compound, I, more to, more is sounding to me like you are, um, you have like a high pressure impulse end of a turbine rotor, which is introduced immediately into an intermediate pressure um like reaction motor or rotor all all within one rotor within one turbine instead of it being separate like on the queen mary does that make do you understand what i'm saying for me that is too difficult to understand <laughs> but and it's, it's it's reaching a little bit you know above my yeah you know comprehension i didn't go to school for marine engineering or, or for steam turbines you know I, I understand a little bit enough to be enough to be dangerous but that was the whole reason why i wanted to do this was to try and speak in more of a layman's term of of how things work and and i gather what information i can i gather what information i know from from work experience and just you know from experience in general and uh you know a cross compound reading from this i i it sounds as though it's you're introducing two different pressures um within a single turbine carl trotter was commenting uh that uh he's only ever seen one steam engine in operation the triple expansion engines on the ps waverly he says they're loud, but you can still talk. And it's actually kind of funny that he says that because I was just talking to my friend Chris the other day about Titanic's engines because uh, we, we played Titanic Honor and Glory and you can go into the engine rooms in that mm. game and see them. And uh, I was telling him that the engine room would have been loud. He goes, oh, it would have been quiet because it's a triple expansion. But I'm like, well, triple expansion engines are still pretty loud, you know, but, uh, but, I, well, but he did know. make a. But he did make a point that steam turbine engines are louder than reciprocating engines. I, I would agree. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. totally agree. Because, you know, with the with the turbine engines, you're, you're talking about a, a motorized hum. You know, you've got a constant revolution of of a large piece of machinery. You know, the, the, each of those rotors spinning. And, and, you know, there's, you know, recorded sounds from the engine room on the Queen Mary. And you can hear, you know, it sounds like a big electric motor. Oop, I just spilled my drink. Um, <laughs> you know, That's it, not it, supposed it, to happen. I know. It, it, so you, you have a buildup of this noise. Whereas on, on a reciprocating engine, the, uh, the only sound you're going to hear is, you know, is you hear clunk 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 because the um the piston arm is is moving from with the cam you get the you get the piston arm that's moving with the cam and then and then the um or the rod you got the rod moving with the cam and then you've got the the up and down motion of the piston mm -hmm. I, I, far less noise generation in my opinion than than from a turbine yeah a turbine is definitely much louder than a, a, a reciprocating engine. And yeah, from, you know, what I heard, Queen Mary's, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, and uh, SS United States had some of the loudest steam turbine engines there were. <laughs> so I see, uh, I see Nathan Leggy. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but Nathan Leggy made a comedy. He says, has Steve wrote any books? No. I'm not sure if I even want to write a book. I, I'd like to maybe write. I, I actually, what I'd really like to do is, I, I'm not so much on text and information as far as, you know, like what we just went through now. Um, mm -hmm. I'd really love to spend a couple of weeks in University of Liverpool and go through their photo archives and get, you know, the rights to publish images that maybe nobody's ever seen before. And create like a coffee table book. I'd love to create a Queen Mary coffee table book. Mm -hmm. That'd be really great. I'd like to have something like that. Yeah. Well, folks, I do have to get us going because it's we've been on here for a while. <laughs> Did we reach two hours? 
we went oh, over two hours. We yeah. went, of course, we went over two hours. Yep. Yeah. But at least we were able to answer questions before we left, you know, because we were worried that we wouldn't have time to answer questions. I don't think but... we hardly have ever been able to answer questions in some of the others. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to thank you so much, Steve, for, you know, helping put all this together and for Rob for, you know, for coming in and supplying some of that information and you know of course uh, i only know so much and so it this is an, a learning experience for me as it is for everyone else um and for anybody that has information that you are certain we got something wrong feel free to comment in the comments below help us by telling us where we can find that information ourselves so we can make those corrections and whatnot um, we, we can never get everything right all the time mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, that's yeah. one of the things we love about the Queen Mary is we're always learning something new. Always, always. You bet. So thank you guys so much, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye, we'll everybody. see you later. Bye-bye.